Okay, uh, continue my discussion um, of the Aryans and talk a, a bit more about the Rig Veda. Um, and I want to remind you uh, of what I had said about the Rig Veda, which is that it is a highly anomalous, it has a highly anomalous position in Indian slash Hindu society. Because, for example, as I had mentioned to you, if you make a comparison with the Quran, I mean, if you're a Muslim, the Quran is an indispensable part of your life. Right? You're supposed to read the Quran, you're supposed to know it. Now, that's not the status that the Rig Veda actually occupies among Hindus. Right? And I had given a, a, a description of that, which I'm not going to go over again at this point in time, but I just wanted to remind you of that. So we're going to talk about the Aryans, the Rig Veda, keeping in mind that the Rig Veda is being used here as an illustration for certain kinds of arguments, not really as an illustration of its supreme importance, but rather that because it's the earliest text that we have in any Indo-European language, right? roughly dated to about 1500 BCE, somewhere around that point in time. Right? Existing in the oral tradition, again something we'll talk about later on because we're going to find that this is going to be true of most of the Indian texts, that they first exist in the, in the oral tradition and then at some point they're going to get written down and then we're going to run into various complications which we don't really have the time to address in this course because if for example you have a text that has been handed down in the oral tradition, as it continues to be handed down in the oral tradition, the text keeps on changing. People add to it. They delete stuff. And then the scholars much later on, 2,000 years, are going to worry, what is the original text? What were the portions that were added later on? Right? So forth and so on. And this is a, this is a profound problem in the study of early Indian texts. But it's going to be of importance to the Rig Veda because we're going to find that certain elements of the social structure of the Aryans are going to become transparent in the Rig Veda as well. And then we're going to eventually move on to the Upanishads and eventually then to Buddhism and Jainism, which are the so-called heterodox religions, right? So that's more or less the agenda for today. Parts of it will be carried on into the lecture on Friday. Now, I mentioned to you that there are actually four Vedas, the Rig Veda, Atharva Veda, Yajur Veda, Sama Veda. The Rig Veda is the one that most people are concerned about, uh, 1,028 hymns, right? And again, passed down in the oral tradition. But before I talk about that, let's just go back to the Aryans for a second, right? So you recall what I would mentioned to you that the Aryans have come from much further west of India, from the Ural Mountains, from the area around Georgia, somewhere around there, you know, and then they're going to disperse. Now, there is a theory which we need to know something about. It's a theory that is going to be first uh, put forward by a man called Sir William Jones in the second half of the 18th century. And what he's essentially going to argue, because he, he is an English, Englishman who's living in India. right? So we are now jumping, of course, much later to the late 18th century. And William Jones is a scholar as well. He's a judge. He's a scholar. Uh, he does a study of Sanskrit. He's already extremely well versed in Latin and Greek. All right. Now, William Jones is going to come to the conclusion, to cut a very long story short, that essentially there is a family of languages which is known as the Indo-European family of languages. So if you look at India, you've got essentially, according to the conventional view, you've got three families of languages, Indo-European, usually, by the way, abbreviated as I-E, Indo-European, and then you have the Dravidian languages, which are the languages predominantly found in South India. And then you have a third family called the Austro-Asiatic, uh, which again is, by the way, a rather jumbled up category because what it includes is a lot of tribal languages. But these tribal languages are highly dispersed throughout India. Right? So in a way, it's, a, a, if I may put it this way, a category of convenience where you put everything that doesn't really belong in the Indo-European and Dravidian. Of course, a linguist will say that the reasons for why they put all these languages in, in the Austroasiatic. Now, the Indo-European language, family of languages, includes a language, of course, known as Sanskrit, which is the language that William Jones set about studying. Right? And then you've got all these North Indian languages, which I'm simply going to mention for you here. I mean, just a few of them so that you know which ones we're, we're thinking about. Hindi would be an example, Marathi, Gujarati. Marathi and Gujarati are spoken in Western India. Then you've got languages such as Bengali, which is spoken in Eastern India, right? And many others. But these are all derived from Sanskrit. Okay, they're all derived from Sanskrit. That's the parent language. William Jones has a theory. 
in brief, the theory is the following, that Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit are all intimately related to each other. And they are all derived from one common language, which linguists call Proto-Indo-European. Okay, that language is not really known, but the way that William James came to this conclusion was he essentially did a grammatical study, obviously, and he looked at the vocabulary of Greek and Latin and Sanskrit, and came to the conclusion that there were enormous similarities, and there were similarities not simply of vocabulary, but there were similarities of grammar, and so on, right? And this is essentially the view that you have this language, you have this language called the Indo-European, and then you have languages which are spoken in South India, such as Tamil, Kannada, and so on, which are Dravidian languages. Now, this Indo-European, this theory, is really a theory about languages, but it's going to become a racial theory. Because the idea is that the Aryans, when they dispersed, from wherever they dispersed, whether it was Georgia, the, you know, somewhere around there, the Caucasus Mountains, the Ural Mountains, wherever they dispersed from, these different languages such as Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit ultimately were different branches emanating from one common stock. Okay, right? So this is that they dispersed. So if, if you, let's say, dis, they dispersed from this point in time, and some went east to, and to Persia, and some went further east to India, and then you have some who are in Europe, Western Europe, that all of these people are intimately related to each other. And of course, one of the problems with this whole theory has to do with the fact that eventually, race, language, ethnicity, all of these are going to get conflated together. So if you look at what the Nazi theory is about Aryanism, in fact, in fact it's actually going to conflate all of these categories. All right? And this is important for us because remember that what I mentioned to you, one of the interesting things, one of the interesting problems we have is that if you think about who the Aryans were and where they came from, so this is that rough map of India, and we said, oh, you know, over here you have this linguistic group, okay, the Brahui group. And the Brahui language is related to the Dravidian languages spoken over here, right? And so this gives us an idea that when the Aryans came and pushed their way further south, right, the people who were living here in the northwest got pushed down further south, but there's a small pocket of people who got left behind, all right? So what we <coughs> are saying about the Aryans is that these people are coming from much further west. They're largely pastoralist. Immense differences between them okay, and the Harappan people, who may or may not be the same as the Dravidian people, right? And some of those differences are, for example, the fact that the Aryans are going to have a complicated language. It's going to be called Sanskrit. The word itself, by the way, means the perfect tongue. That's what the word means. Now, there's a little conceit there. Somebody who likes to think of his or her language as the perfect tongue, right? Okay? And the Harappan people, by contrast, they have a language which obviously not that well developed and hasn't been deciphered down to the present day, but you've got immense archaeological evidence. Comparatively, for the Aryans, you have no evidence at all. And then I mentioned to you, just to complete my summary of what we know about the Aryans, or what I've mentioned up till this point in time, we know that the horse is brought by the Aryans with them, right? Because you don't find any osteological evidence, any bones, for example, from the remains of horses dating back to before 2000 BCE. You begin to get that after 2000 BC. So that suggests that the Aryans first started coming to India roughly around 2000 BCE. When they bring the horse, they also are going to have the spoked wheel. And with the spoked wheel and the horse, you can put together a chariot. And when you put together a chariot, you also introduce certain forms of social differentiation in a culture. Right? Because those who can use the chariot and those who cannot, well, obviously, you have a certain form of hierarchy. Right? So this is sort of roughly the sort of thing that you need to bear in mind. I mean, there's a great deal else. I mean, a lot of the people who write about the Aryans write about the importance of the fire, okay, the element of fire in early Aryanism. You know, you get fire altars. You get fire altars, and we know that many of the sacrifices are done around the fire. We know that the early Aryan rituals which some of which have persisted in India down to the present day, right, would include the use of fire as, for example, in a Hindu marriage, where the Hindu marriage takes place around a fire, okay, right? 
and so forth and so on. So one could add that kind of element to it, but I think that this is more or less enough for what you need to know. Now, if we go back to the Rig Veda, right, because what is a Rig Veda? As I said, it's a collection of hymns, 1,028 hymns, uh, and probably the collection was first put together sometime around 1500 BCE, right? Now, one of the hymns that you find in the Rig Veda is what is called the hymn to creation. Okay, and I want to read out this hymn. It's an extraordinary work, and I'm going to ask you to keep in mind when you listen to it, the difference between its account of creation and the account of creation that you find, for example, in Genesis. Right? But if you know the account in Genesis, you know it's, and it's mentioned very clearly what happened. It takes place over a period of several days. Right? The waters are parted. Right? And there's a, there's a kind of a, if I may put it this way, a finality to it. Right? That this is what creation was. Now let's look at this account by way of contrast. <coughs> There was neither non-existence nor existence then. There was neither the realm of space nor the sky which is beyond. What stirred? Where? In whose protection was their water bottomlessly deep? As you think about this verse and the verses that are going to follow, think about what's happening. That what we're really encountering here is the first kind of speculation okay, about the nature of existence. Right? Where do we come from? Where do we go? Right? And you're not going to get much about the soul. You're going to get that in the Upanishads later on. Right? But what is the nature of existence? Right? How did this world come about? I mean, that is the set of questions that the author or authors of this hymn are pondering about. There was neither death nor immortality then. There was no distinguishing sign of night nor of day. That one, that one is probably the primeval one, the, the creator, right? Breathed, windless, by its own impulse. Other than that, there was nothing beyond. Darkness was hidden by darkness in the beginning. With no distinguishing sign, all this was water. The life force that was covered with emptiness, that one arose through the power of heat. Desire came upon that one in the beginning. Now this is a little clue, by the way, how life begins. There's something called desire, right? The desire to multiply, for example. That was the first seed of mind. Poets seeking in their heart with wisdom found the bond of existence and non-existence. Their cord was extended across. Was there below? Was there above? There were seed places, there were powers, there was impulse beneath, there was giving forth above. Who really knows? It's a mystery. Right? It's a mystery. Certain kind of agnosticism about it. Who will here proclaim it? Whence was it produced? Whence is this creation? The gods came afterwards with the creation of this universe. So there's one, the gods came afterwards. So there's some god before the gods, right? Or the creator, the ultimate being, whatever language you use to designate it, with the creation of this universe, who then knows whence it has arisen? And here you get this stunning last paragraph now, okay? Whence this creation has arisen? Perhaps it formed itself, or perhaps it did not. The one who looks down on it, so it's like the creator is up there looking down on the creation, right? Everything that's been created. The one who looks down on it in the highest heaven, only he knows, or perhaps he does not know, right? I mean, even the creator doesn't really know how all of this came about, right? And so there's, there's this very refreshing kind of what I'm describing as in a way, spiritual or intellectual agnosticism, that we have to remain skeptics about our understanding of how creation really came about, right? Now, the Rig Veda has a number of other hymns, of course. We're going to look at one or two of them in due course of time. But what I want you to do for a moment is to turn your attention to what I've written on the board here. And I've written in big, bold letters in the hope that those of you... Can you see this in the back, what I've written over there? All right, good. So, you've got the four Vedas. Um, the four here happens to be a coincidence, shall we say. Don't, we don't have to get into numerology or any of that sort of thing. Okay? I mean, there are people in India who are always getting into numerology. You know, and they see four, ve four Vedas, four stages of life. And then you know, somebody will say, well, the number four has some supreme importance. Not really. Okay? You've got the Chatur Varna or the four Varnas. And we need to say a little bit about that. 
And what I'm going to say here is going to have repercussions for everything in the course because one of the things that is supposed to distinguish Indian society from any other known society is what is called the caste system. Okay, The word for caste, caste is not an Indian word at all. It's a Portuguese word. All right, It's a Portuguese word. So we are constantly running into this problem, aren't we? That everything that we are using to describe India, including the word Hinduism, including the word India, including the word caste, I mean, all of these words are not really Indian words. Okay? But the caste system as it is known, right? the Sanskrit is Varna, okay? and Chatur means four. So one of the things that you find is in, in what is today called Hinduism is the presence of the Chatur Varna system. But we have to make a little distinction okay, between two words here. So I have to introduce another word here. And that distinction is between, so the English word is caste. And then, as I said, it's usually the Sanskrit equivalent would be considered to be either Varna or sometimes the word Jati. Okay? And I'm going to explain the difference in a moment when I go through what these four castes are supposed to be. Right? Now, according to the Rig Veda, and there is another hymn here. I'm going to read just one paragraph of that hymn, not the entire hymn. And this is called the hymn of the primeval man. The hymn of the primeval man. Okay. So now the work of creation that we had witnessed before, now this is being differentiated further. Okay. I mean, how did different things come about? Right. How do we distinguish between cattle and horses? When did all of this come really about? Okay. So when they divided the man... Okay, when they divided the man, and they here is the gods. When they divided the man, the primeval man, the primordial man, into how many parts did they divide him? Right? What was his mouth? What were his arms? What were his thighs and his feet called? The Brahmin was his mouth. Okay, that's the Brahmin. The Brahmin was his mouth. Of his thighs was made the warrior. Of, sorry, of his arms was made the warrior. His thighs became the Vaishya. Of his feet, the Shudra was born. Okay, so you've got, so the, the uh, Brahmin is associated with, you know, the top, with the mouth. The, the warrior, which is the Kshatriya, comes from the arms. The Vaishya comes from the thighs and the Shudra comes from the feet, from the bottom. Okay. Now, according to the theory of Varna, or the theory of Chatur Varna, you have these four Varnas. Each of these Varnas is associated with a profession, with a calling. Right? The best word, frankly, actually is occupation. Okay? So the Varnas are supposed to be, or if you're more comfortable with the word caste, think of it as caste, but we'll see what are some of the complications there in a moment. Right? That each of these caste was associated with an occupation. So the Brahmins are supposed to be the repositories of sacred knowledge. They're the priests. Right? And again, when we use the word priest, we're sort of using Christian terminology here. I'm not quite sure that the word priest completely describes what a Brahmin is, but they're the ones who are in possession of sacred knowledge and they pass down the knowledge from one generation to another. Okay? The Brahmins are also those who are going to be present at the most sacred ceremonies associated with an individual and an individual's life such as the rite of marriage okay a, pram, a priest a brahmin priest is usually has to be there in order to preside over a marriage all right then you've got the kshatriyas so the kshatriyas are the people who are the warriors right and they do the temporal work so one of the things we can do is we can make a distinction here we can say that these two are a pair because the Brahmins exercise spiritual power, the Kshatriyas exercise material or temporal power. Right? They are the ones who do the muscle work, if you had to be colloquial about it. Okay? Then you've got the Vaishyas, and the Vaishyas are the people who are people who are merchants, traders, shopkeepers, right? The middling castes. The middling castes. And then you've got the Shudras. Who would be considered, I mean, if you had to use the English equivalent, it would be something like slaves. But again, slavery is a concept borrowed from European history. You know, did we have something equivalent to slavery 
How was it different? One would have to get into those questions, but if you had to render the shooters, the shooters are the people who really are the disempowered ones, right? They are the ones who do the dirty work, some of the dirty work, the leg work, all right? And there is a distinction made. Sometimes the three top castes together are called the Dvija or the twice born. They are the ones who can undertake certain kinds of rituals that are going to be then associated with Hinduism. The Shudras cannot, right? And <coughs> many of the people who are, of course, ferocious opponents of the caste system will look at this particular passage, the one that I just cited to you, and suggest that this form of discrimination, right? Because what does this do? It sets up a hierarchy. That this form of discrimination has been present in India right from the outset. Now there, there's another view. The other view is that in fact actually this is simply a way of demarcating occupations, right? And there is nothing in the early texts, according to this view, which suggests that the Brahmin should be viewed as being superior, for example, to the Shudra. It says that different people have different callings in life. Okay? And so one of the things that was argued, for example, by a man called R. Radhakrishnan, who wrote a little book called The Hindu View of Life. And Radhakrishnan, by the way, was uh, the, the example of, if you might put it this way, borrowing the Platonic example, he was a, a poet king. Okay? I mean, he's going to become the president of India, um, after independence, shortly after independence, but he's also a philosopher, right? And one of the things that he writes is that if you look at ancient Indian society, you're going to find that the Brahmins were never adequately compensated for their work because the idea was that a Brahmin, since he exercises a kind of spiritual power, that in itself is reward for what he does. That if you're b f much further down the ladder, the work that you're doing may not be pleasant and therefore you have to be financially compensated more. Okay? I mean, this was a view that he took, just to give you an illustration of how one might understand some of these things. Now there is a little problem that we have to be alert to. And this is a problem that you'll have to think about because it, it, its repercussions, as I said, come down to the present day. One of the texts that is used to understand the system the caste system, because the Rig Veda doesn't really tell you much. You've got this hymn to creation, but then it doesn't tell you, well, what are the social relations between the four castes? For example, can Brahmins and Shudras eat together? Can they marry together? Can Vaishyas and Brahmins eat together? What are the consequences if they eat together? Okay, Is the punishment for stealing a chicken the same, whether you're a Brahmin or a Kshatriya or a Vaishya or a Shudra? Right? So what you have is a, a huge work. It's going to be called the Manu Smriti. Okay? Manu Smriti. And it's actually mentioned in my little book here. All, and in, translated into English as the laws of Manu. Dated to roughly around the 2nd century um, uh, AD. Okay? In the common, sec, 2nd century of the common era. Now, Manu Smriti has an elaborate description of these social relations. Right? Now, if you read Manu Smriti, one of the things you find out is that a Brahmin, being the person at the highest order, okay, could easily get contaminated or polluted by even the mere presence of a Shudra. Right? The mere presence of a Shudra. Right? So if you're a Brahmin and you're walking down the street and a Shudra is coming from the other end of the street, the Shudra is supposed to announce his presence. For example, by ringing a bell, right? And why is he supposed to announce his presence? Because if he should cross paths with the Brahmin, the Brahmin will get polluted. He'll get contaminated. And if he gets contaminated, then he has to undergo a series of penances. He may have to go home, take a ritual bath, right? Purify himself, purify his house, etc., etc., etc. The Manu Smriti is in fact going to tell you all about that. Now this is where the problem becomes, where the problem comes in. Let's suppose that you're living in modern India, okay, and you're traveling on a bus, and if one of you has ever traveled in one of those Indian buses, which was designed for 30 people and holds 100 people, right, and you're, you know, the person next to you doing this, you're not asking them all the time, are you a Brahmin or are you a Shudra, right, because hey, I'm, I happen to be a Brahmin, and so the person next to me is a Shudra, and I'm going to get completely contaminated, right. In other words, the problem is this. That this description of the Chatur Varna is a textbook version. Always be wary of textbooks. 
Okay? No matter in what shape or form they come. Because what textbooks do is they standardize, homogenize knowledge. Right? So this is a textbook view. It says that, ah, this is a relationship between a Brahmin and a Shudra. But of course in modern India, there are tens of millions of encounters taking place every day between Shudras and Brahmins. And not all of those 10 million encounters lead to 10 million ritual baths by Brahmins afterwards. Right? So this is what we mean by the distinction between Varna and Jati. Varna is the understanding of caste when it's a textbook view. Jati is actually how these castes really operate on the ground. How they operate on the ground may have little relationship to what the textbook view is. I'm not saying that there is never any relationship between the two. Don't mistake me. Okay? So the, for example, who you marry, well then Varna might become very important. Jati might be important too. Right? Relations on the ground as opposed to the textbook view. And of course, if you were the Orientalist, what would you do? You would look at the Manusmriti, which was written, written in the second century CE, and then imagine that what the Manusmriti is describing holds true for 1900 or for the year 2000. That's where Orientalism comes in. When you take these texts and then imagine that they can be understood in exactly the same way that they were to be understood 2000 years ago. Okay, so these are the four Varnas that are described in the Rig Veda, right? But we cannot make too many inferences about the nature of the social structure. We can make some inferences because obviously someone will come along and say, well, we can make an inference that there is a real hierarchy there because why is the Brahmin the top and the Shudra the bottom, right? But let me complicate that for you a little bit now. In, for example, what is called the bhakti tradition. You're going to hear a lot more about that when we get into the fifth, sixth week, somewhere around there. The bhakti tradition. I'd actually mentioned it in passing before. So the word bhakti translates into devotion. Okay, so there's going to be this huge movement. It's called the bhakti movement. In the bhakti movement, there is this idea that you have to reduce yourself to zero. You have to become nothing in order to really receive the love of God. By the way, this idea is not something that is alien to Western thought. I mean, if you read medieval Western mystics, they will argue exactly the same thing. Okay? And one of the things that you were supposed to do to show your sign of devotion to your spiritual teacher is you wash the feet of your guru and you drink that water with which you wash the feet of the guru. Okay? It shows your ability to reduce yourself, to say, I have no ego at all. No ego. I'm completely egoless. Okay? Right? And so we, what I'm saying is that, well, yes, the feet is the bottom, but of course, if you didn't have any feet, well, you would be incomplete. Right? You would be inc incomplete without the feet. You would be incomplete without your arms, without your legs, without certain things that you have on your face, your tongue, right, ears, whatever the case might be. So the question is, is this only a hierarchy or do these different varnas exist in a complementary relationship? But complementary relationships may still have certain forms of social differentiation, right? This is what I want you to bear in mind when we begin to try to understand what is the nature of the varna system. And why are we doing it right now? Because we are saying it exists in the early Veda. And therefore, this tells us something about the social structure of the Aryans, right? Because we were not able to make inferences to this degree regarding the social structure of the people known as the Harappans. Now, we're able to make more inferences because we've got a number of texts which begin to emerge from the early Aryans, right? Now, the early texts are also going to mention the four stages of life, that everybody goes through four stages in life. Okay, that this now, now this is a different part of understanding what is the nature of organization, social organization in the society. How are people thinking this far back about what is a place that one occupies in a society and what kind of duties and responsibilities and rights one has. Okay, and I'm using these words provisionally because the idea of rights, for example, is again a relatively modern idea. 
relatively modern idea, right? So we have to be a little, little circumspect in our use of these words. But what are these four stages? So the first stage of life is what is called brahmacharya. The brahmacharya is when you're a student. You're supposed to be devoted to learning. Okay, the word is also, by the way, rendered as celibacy because the idea is that when you are devoted to the pursuit of knowledge and learning, you should also be celibate during that period of time, right? So that you can be fully devoted to the pursuit of learning, right? This is the first stage of life. Then you move into what is called grehast or grehastia, which is when you marry. You become, to use the English word, a householder. You acquire a spouse, you have children. And when you have children and you have a spouse, you have certain kinds of responsibilities that come into place. You have to be responsible for your spouse, you have to be responsible for feeding your children, right? educating them, so forth and so on. This is the second stage of life. All right? The third stage of life is what is called vanaprastha, which is when you decide that you're slowly going to withdraw from this world. Slowly. You haven't fully done it yet. right? You haven't become the complete renouncer. And the Indian texts, some of the Indian texts say, well, how does one know one has entered Vanaprastha? Well, when the, when the first white hairs begin to appear, right? All right? On you, that's when you know you have entered the stage of Vanaprastha. Now, why should you begin to withdraw slowly from life? In order to understand that, we'll have to look at the four ends, right? So just keep that in mind for a moment. But this is how you mark this stage and then finally there is a stage of the renouncer sannyas the person who undertakes sannyas is called the sannyasi okay uh, sometimes rendered into english as fakir or the yogi but sannyasi sannyasi is a person who renounces life says that look all right i've had a family i've had children i've done my duty i've paid my taxes shall we say okay right right now i'm tired of all of this I want to contemplate on richer, more profound questions. What is the nature of existence? How does one get liberated from this cycle? You know, and there is a cycle. Every day you wake, wake up and it's the same humdrum things in life. It gets tedious after a while. Right? Who wants to go to a job? Nine to five, you know, right? That's one good thing about being a professor. You don't do nine to five. Right? right? Yeah, it's humdrum life. So what sannyas here means, you decide you're going to withdraw from life. You go into a hermitage, you retreat into the mountains, you isolate yourself, right, to ponder over the fundamental questions of human existence. The nature of good, the nature of beauty, the nature of truth, so forth and so on, right? These are the four stages of life recommended in the early texts, all right? And I want to make a little distinction here, right? Because you're not really going to find a full-blown account of this in the very early text. And this is where now we have to make a little distinction, okay, between two categories of Indian texts, right? And those two categories of texts, uh, it's not frankly that useful a distinction, but it needs to be understood, is a category of text called Shruti, Okay, which is what the Rig Veda falls into, right? Shruti is what is heard. So revealed texts, they're not that many revealed texts. In fact, the only revealed texts really are the Vedas. Uh, but the word Vedas itself, by the way, is sometimes used in two or three different ways. So sometimes it includes just the four Vedas. So when somebody says the Vedas, they may be referring to the four Vedas or they may be referring to the four Vedas plus a series of texts called the Upanishads, which again you are reading very brief excerpts from, we'll talk about these later on, sometimes it includes that as well. And so Shruti may include the Upanishads, but it includes the Vedas. And then you have a range of texts which are called Smriti. Okay, right? You've already encountered this word in Manu Smriti, right? Manu Smriti. Smriti is remembered. Remembered. Texts that are remembered, right? That is a second category of texts, and they have to do with such things as conduct, law. There are many different kinds of Smritis. So one of the smithies that you get are the law books, okay? Right? The dharma, various kinds of dharma smithies, law books, books that describe the conduct that we are supposed to engage in, right? What are our responsibilities to others? What are the responsibilities others have to us, 
What is my responsibility to the state? What is my relationship to the state, to government, to civil society, right? What is the different relationship between the different orders of society? All of this is going to be found in the Smritis. All right? right? So we, these are now, as I said, the four Vedas, the Chaturvarna, the four stages. And now let me end with a description of the four ends of life as described in the ancient text. Right? The four ends of life are, and you can pair these. So you can say that these two are, constitute one pair. Artha and Kama, Dharma and Moksha constitute a second pair. Okay? And many of the people who have looked at Hinduism say that, well, actually, the description of these four ends of life suggests the comprehensive nature of the examination of society that was going on at this point in time in India, because in a sense, these four ends of life are supposed to encompass the totality of human experience. So what are these four ends of life? We have an obligation to acquire artha. Artha is money, material well-being. There's going to be a text later on. It's going to be called the Artha Shastra. The Artha Shastra, right? The Artha Shastra is the science of not making money. You know, that sounds like one of these books, right? Seven Steps to Becoming a Billionaire or whatever, right? Okay? No, it's not the science of making money. It's the science of material well-being, the science of materiality. So the Artha Shastra is, is a huge compendium which is actually going to give you a full-blown account of the nature of Indian society at that point in time in which it was written, right? How many elephants and how many horses did the king have, right? Uh, what are the different forms of obligations that a state has? What are the different kinds of revenues that it collects? But the word artha means literally here money and material well-being. So we have an obligation. The four ends of life means the four the four things we should, the four goals we should keep in mind. We should think of our well-being. Kama, love, sex. And of course, some of you have heard of the Kama Sutra. Well, that's where the word Kama is, the Kama Sutra, right? That physical pleasure, but again, we cannot reduce it simply to physical pleasure. The Kama Sutra is a lot more than a description of physical pleasure or the various kinds of positions that you can have, you know, right? No, it's a lot more than that. It has to do with what are the relationships between husband and wife. You know, how should each of them prepare for the other? You know, right? So forth and so on. Okay? So this is supposed to be a pair. Physical well-being. Okay? Sexual pleasure. All of that. As well as material well-being. And what, what is one of the reasons, by the way, that one needs to think about artha? Because, for example, when you are in the stage of grahastya, when you're a householder, you have to take care, not only of yourself, you have to take care of your spouse and your children and your parents, right? And you need some amount of material well-being in order to be able to do that. These are two ends of life that can be paired together. They can be considered the lower ends of life, according to the Indian text. They're necessary, but in some ways we have to realize that if we limited ourselves to these, this would be a rather circumscribed view of the potentiality of human beings. Now the other two ends of life are dharma and moksha. Dharma is one of these words, you know, if you look up the Sanskrit dictionary, the definition goes on and on and on. Okay, so very often, you remember my first lecture where I said that, well, actually, there's really no word for religion in Indian languages, right? Right, certainly not in Sanskrit. And the word that is used is dharma. That's a word that is used, but dharma means law, morality, conduct, righteousness, virtue. Now, there's one thing that's very interesting, seldom talked about in, dis in discussions of dharma. That is that each one of us has our dharma, but so do all other animate beings. You know, if you have a pet dog, and the dog is barking away, and you get furious, well, you have to remind yourself, the dharma of the dog is to bark. That's the dharma of the dog. The dharma of the snake is to hiss. Right? Each animal, each species has its own dharma. Of course, we are fundamentally interested in the dharma of human beings, 
right? What is my dharma? If I am placed in a certain position, which is a morally precarious situation where it is not clear what the correct right course of action would be, then I have to think about the nature of dharma. Maybe that might help illuminate the path for me at my moment of uncertainty. All right? That's what dharma means. Okay? Right, right conduct, right adherence to law, morality, virtuousness, so forth and so on. And then finally, we have moksha, the supreme end according to the Upanishads. Okay? And what is moksha? Moksha is liberation, spiritual emancipation, where you come to the realization, right, that this is the nature of life and this is how you free yourself from the burdens of life. You become the liberated one, the emancipated one. The Buddhists don't really use the word moksha, they use the word nirvana, as we're going to find out when we start looking at Buddhism shortly, you know, next lecture, right? But what in Hindu terms, if I may put it this way, or Sanskrit terms, the Buddha achieved was moksha. That is spiritual emancipation. And then you become fit to teach others as well. All right? So these are the four ends of life. And what we're saying in part is that if you look at early Aryan society, early Aryan slash Vedic society, all of these things are coming into place. So now we know a great deal more about the social structure of the life. And all of this is developing not, you know, it's not developing right in a jiffy, right in a moment with the coming of the Aryans. I mean, this is developing over a course of several centuries, maybe even a millennium, right? The Upanishads, which we're going to look at later on, the earliest of the Upanishads is dated roughly around 800 BCE. The Rig Veda, as I said, about 1500 BCE, right? And you're not really going to get, so for example, if you start looking at the Upanishads, we're going to see that there's some fundamental distinctions that are going to come into place, which haven't even existed at the time of the Vedas. But what we're saying is that from the time of the coming of the Aryans, for the next 1000 years, what they're developing is a certain social philosophy, which also gives us some indication of the social structure of life. Now, let me say a little bit more about uh, th the kind of religion that the early Aryans might have had. The Rig Vedas have many gods. The Rig Veda describes many gods. In fact, one of the chief gods that is described is a god by the name of Indra. Okay? And he is described as a destroyer of cities. Now, that tells you something, right? That Why is he described as a destroyer of cities? Remember, the, the Harappans had cities. Mohenjo-daro, Harappa, Lothal, right? And Indra is quite accurately described as the destroyer of cities because the early Aryans, right, they saw themselves, the word Arya, by the way, is to be found in Old Persian as well, and of course in Sanskrit, and it means the noble one, the fair-skinned one, okay? And the Rig Veda, by the way, describes the Aryas, the fair-skinned one, destroying, crushing in battle the dark-skinned one. Now you get the color distinction, right? You get the color distinction. But I'm going to ask you to bear in mind that there's a difference between color consciousness and race consciousness. The two are not identical. Just keep that in mind. We're going to get to that point much later on in this course. Okay, but you see a distinction between the fair-skinned ones and the dark-skinned ones. It's also the dark-skinned ones are also, by the way, they're called dasas. The word dasa, uh, the word dasa, so in plural here, uh, means roughly slave, okay, servant, okay. But again, to illustrate the complexity of this, think of that example of the foot that I was talking about, right? In the Bhakti movement, some of the greatest saints have names such as Surdas, okay, same ending, Das, Dasa, same word, Tulsi Das, okay, the slave of or the servant of okay that is that the idea is that when you become spiritually empowered you also realize that you are a vehicle for the love of god and you have to extinguish yourself this is a different way of understanding moksha what is this goal called moksha it's the extinction of yourself the extinction of your ego right 
now the Rig Veda, so now we are looking at this idea of Dasa in two different domains. Okay, so in the Rig Veda, if you go back, the Rig Veda talks about how Indra is to be understood as the chief god. He is the god with the thunderbolt, right? And he is a god who is a destroyer of cities. And the Rig Veda talks about how Indra helped by others, you know, helped in the destruction of the Dasas who were probably the early Harappans. Now, remember that the Aryans are people who are largely pastoralists. Okay, their gods also are gods of nature, principally. Right, so I've already mentioned to you Indra, chief of the gods, the god of rain, the god of weather, Agni, the god of fire, Vayu, the god of wind, Varuna, the god of rivers and seas, right, Ushas, the god of dawn, Rudra, god of the storm, right, so these are the gods and the others as well that are going to appear in the hymns of the Rig Veda and it gives us some kind of clue into who these people were, what were their concerns, they're dealing with the elements largely, these are people who are not going to develop a complicated urban civilization, right? Any question at this point before I move on to the next segment? Anything about the Vedas, you know, the four ends of life, the Chaturvarna, the distinction between, between, yes. So, so the, those four stages of life, does that only apply to the Brahmins? No, no, no. No, it applies to the Sutras? No, no, no. This is, you remember I said that there happen to be four of everything here, but it's not like Brahmins have an obligation to acquire moksha and nobody else does. Or the Kshatriyas have an obligation to engage in grasta and they have no other end in life. No, each person has these four ends in life. Okay? It may be the case that a Brahmin is better equipped to acquire moksha. Maybe. That's a different argument. But you can't say that each, that these four ends of life only apply to one of the Varnas and do not apply to the other Varnas. Right? All right? Okay, I think that we're going to have to pretty much, we're, we're, we're at time right now. So we're going to end over here and just make sure you read the reading for this week that you finished it before you come to class on Friday because we're going to get into a discussion of the Upanishads and then move into Buddhism and Jainism eventually, you know, all right?